Erev Tov Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benun with Danun Institute of Biblical Research. And I have something that the Lord has placed on my heart this morning, and I've pondered this throughout the day. And I've gone back, I've looked at the Word of God, and I, I'm just, I have to just tell you I am troubled in my heart, in my soul, for the condition of uh, the church of God and seeing now it's like the Lord let me see just flash by me the condition of the church and what she's in when I say the church I'm talking about those that are truly called out the believers that love the Lord and many of them keeping in mind many of these believers are, are trapped in uh, different religious systems that are now going back to Rome that are joining back with the Vatican. And what happened this morning, we, we were talking, uh, I was talking with my wife and my father-in-law, and we were discussing about the, the, the technology that, that the governments are using. There was a, a report on RT News and RT is a trustworthy news. It's watched in the United States. It's on cable television there. And they were reporting about uh, some type of uh, mysterious ring. Uh, and, and, the, and the Russian people believe that it was some type of um, uh, military technology that's interdimensional that the U.S. Is, that, that they have and they're able to use now. And, and I don't even know if you guys are aware, but recently uh, in Washington, D.C., there was a blackout across Washington. And it, uh, from what we understand here uh, in the east is that it was Russia that did a, 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 some kind of attack on the system in, in Washington, showing that they can block out, black out their entire city grids and their computers and everything. And, um, and, and perhaps you guys are already aware of this, but we, we, this is on our news uh, right here in the east, we're able to see, and I'm still in Europe, so we were actually able to, to monitor this. Of course, we have cable TV. We can watch anything in the world pretty much, but uh, our satellite. But, but we're seeing this, that this happened, and that it was Russia that did it. And we were discussing these things. And I, I began to explain to my, my wife and my father-in-law, I said, you know, that uh, the very book that I have, I don't have it in the room right now, but it's the, it's the inside secrets of the Jesuits and what they're taught in, in, in the Masons. And, and uh, it says in the opening of the book there that if you, when they loan it to the, to the person they're training, that if you don't return it, they kill you. And uh, there was a wonderful brother that had, had somehow gotten a hold of this book and he gave this to me. And I've, I've learned so much. But one of the key things that, that they're trying to discover, the Jesuits have been trying to discover, was the ancient secrets that were known in Egypt. That uh, when Moses, for example, and Aaron, when they were faced with the, the, the priest of, uh, of, the, of Pharaoh, uh, these priests were able to do all kinds of great miracles. And it is believed by the Jesuits that, the, that, these, that, the, that, the, that Egypt still, the temple is actually there. They have studied it for, for decades now, trying to unlock those mysteries. And perhaps they have been unlocking those mysteries because some of the incredible things, interdimensional um, weapons of some sort that they're using now. Uh, and of course, we have no idea what all is there. But as I was explaining to my father-in-law, my wife, is that the showdown that's coming with the two witnesses is going to be a tremendous showdown. I said, you have to remember, it'll be just like they were when Moses came uh, with Pharaoh and his, uh, the, you know, Moses throw his staff down on the ground and it turns to a serpent. And of course, so do the the priest of Pharaoh, they're able to turn theirs into a serpent, and the priest turned the water to blood, just like Moses turned the water to blood. Moses was faced with a, a group that was doing miracles. But Moses believed in God that could do miracles far beyond anything that they could do. And God did. God finally showed that they could not keep up with it. And even finally the priest of Pharaoh said, this is the hand of Almighty God. This is not our gods. We cannot do this. And then 
just all kinds of things. We were discussing this. And as we began to discuss this, I shared with my, my, my wife and my father-in-law something, something happened suddenly and I seen the church. And as I did, I saw the church in bondage. And it troubled me with inside of myself. And, and the Lord began to just un, unroll it before me. And I said, oh my gosh, I said, you're not going to believe this. I said, but what's, what I'm seeing right now is that you have to remember when, when Joseph was sold out by his brethren, he goes down into Egypt. He's, we know he's captive there, but he rises up to the right hand of Pharaoh. He's a perfect type of Christ in all of this. His brethren come. He reveals himself to his brethren. It's a joyous time, and it's a time during uh, a dark time as well because they're during a famine. But then time moves on, and as Joseph dies, his brethren begin to multiply in the land. It's just like when Christ came originally, when Christ was here on the earth, and the disciples began to believe, and there was a great jubilee because the Lord was here. And then the Lord died, and he rose up from the dead, but then he ascended up into heaven, and we begin to multiply in the earth. But as that multiplying increased there, as time went on, we begin to go away. We begin to go away from the Word of God. The church has drifted. And we've had every kind of ism that you can imagine today. I mean, all the different types of denominational views and, and teachings and ideologies and, and cults and whatever more has cropped up. And, it's, and we can hardly find any place where we can say, is this the truth? We hold the Bible, and even in the Bible, we're finding that man, when they translate it into other languages, are trying to manipulate it to fit their agenda. And I saw the church, the believers, those that love the Lord, and keep in mind, People that love the Lord, they may be messed up in a doctrinal view as well. It doesn't mean that they don't love the Lord. Don't, don't be angry with your brother, maybe because he doesn't see something God has revealed to you. But I saw the, the, the believers, and they had become what? They had become under bondage of Pharaoh. And this is what we see in the land today. You see, Pharaoh... There rose up a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Joseph was a representation of Christ. And he was a representation of the gospel, setting free, setting liberty. But there rose up a Pharaoh that the memory of Joseph was no longer there. Hundreds of years have passed. And we're in the same condition today. Hundreds of years have passed. And even though the churches today claim to believe they know Yeshua, and many, believe, many people do, I know that, but there has raised up a man in a spiritual position in the Vatican in Rome who does not know Yeshua. He does not know the power of Jesus Christ. But I read their Jesuit books and they're looking into Egyptian goddesses and, and, the, and the miracles of Egypt and they're looking at the Kabbalah. They're looking at these things to try to figure out how to do miracles. That's Jesuits of the Catholic Church. Not necessarily the, the individual lay people of the Catholic Church that know no more about it. I mean, look how many, how many Catholic brothers and sisters do you have that listen to this ministry, not to mention other that have come out and recognized Christ all over the world and everything. That have renounced Roman Catholicism and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But the Pope of Rome, he doesn't know Joseph. He doesn't know Yeshua. And the thing is, is he set, Pharaoh set taskmasters over the Israelites. And they became in bondage and they began to serve Pharaoh. 
And we're, we're, society is moving to a new world order, to a one world religion, one world system. And they're causing all of these ministers from different denominations and stuff coming back to Mother Rome. Tony Palmer, Bishop Tony Palmer, really a mysterious situation with him altogether, but he spearheaded that. Kenneth Copeland joined up with it. Great movement, go and, go and meet the Pope. John Hagee joined in with it. Many other different well-known evangelists all going back to Rome. All kinds of preachers, Lutherans, Methodists, what have you more, charismatic and all. Even when Pope um, Benedict, when he was inaugurated, they had world heads of the world churches all coming up, bowing down before him and expressing their allegiance to their, of their churches to Rome. When Pope Francis made it in, all the European church leader heads came and bowed down and expressed their, their loyalty to Rome. What are they doing? They're putting the people under bondage and they're appointing taskmasters over you to say, this is the way it is. How then? How is, how is the children of God going to be delivered then? When I begin to look at this and then I begin to think in my heart, I'm like, God, I know that you said, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins and her plagues. God says for you to come out so that you don't partake of her sins, neither her plagues. When are the plagues poured out upon Rome for being the taskmaster over us? For being the Pope of Rome, being the Pharaoh of the earth. He's God on earth, according to what their own writings teach. He is the mediator between Christ and man is what they believe. And yet in your evangelical teachings, you know that that's a lie. There's only one mediator and that's the man, Christ Jesus. So how can you put the Pope of Rome as a vicar? How can you join up with such a system? You know, I went back and I, I, I said, wait a minute. What is this then about the two witnesses? What are they doing? What happens here? And I read it again, and there was given me a reed likened to a rod, Revelation 11. The angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without of the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given to the Gentiles in the holy city, they shall tread underfoot for forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood. And they smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. Plagues, see there? They smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Their ministry is global. And God says, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins and of her plagues. I'm just paraphrasing that one. My people, God's people, is involved in this system. And believe me, that's not just the Catholic Church he's saying, come out of. If your church is joining, if your denominational system is joining in with Rome, it comes to a place that God is calling you to come out. Because why? If the harlots go back to their mother, then you will be partaker of the plague as well. Remember when God had the children of Israel in Egypt there, when they were in Goshen. God separated between the children of God, the, ch the children of Israel there, and the, and the Egyptians there. And the plagues fell upon Pharaoh and, the, and their people there. But in, in, in Goshen, the plagues didn't come. The cattle didn't die. The people didn't die. Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins and of her plagues. So does this perhaps suggest to us 
that the church actually sees the two witnesses in their ministry? Could it be that that rapture doesn't happen necessarily before this happens? Could it be that when we talk about the dead and Christ shall rise first, that that is actually speaking of the death of the two witnesses and we which remain and alive? It's just a thought. It says in verse 7, And they will have, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street. The great city of spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they have the people and the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. The whole world watches the event. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, not the remnant, and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the Spirit from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake. Now, my point that I'm saying to you in this here, when Israel was in bondage after this 400 years, and Pharaoh didn't know Joseph, God sent deliverance to bring them out. Now, notice the scripture says in the book of Exodus, uh, I think it's 12, 38, and a mixed multitude went also up with them and flocks and herds and very much cattle when? When they were exiting Egypt. A mixed multitude, both Jew and Gentile, went up. I want to share with you something else. Though, and I went back to look at this because I'm thinking to myself, you know, Moses was faced with an army. He was faced, him and Aaron, with an army of chariots and swords and not just an army of chariots and swords, but also with priests that could do miracles just the same as Moses and Aaron could, up to a point. Do you realize if Moses and Elijah are to return in this day and God is to use them, and I say Moses and Elijah because even on Mount Transfiguration, see, God is a witness to you who the two uh, the two olive trees that are standing on either side of the golden lampstand where they're standing on either side of Yeshua. It's another proof of who they are, not to mention the miracles that they do, or Elijah and Moses' miracles repeated over again. And, and I know the argument about, they say, well, you know, Moses, uh, he died, he doesn't have to come back, but Elijah and he not. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. Not a, it, it's appointed to once to man to die then. Well, what about the people then that never see death? The Bible says there'll be those that'll be alive and remain and shall not see death. When do they come back and die? They don't. So it doesn't make sense to make that statement. But at any point, though, I begin to look at what God said to Moses here in, um, in Exodus uh, verse 34, chapter 34. In verse 10, and I want to share that with you again. And let me just back up a little bit, and I'm reading from a Jewish Bible here, so let me just bear with me. And Moses made haste and bowed. Let me back up a little bit further here in verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. He's going back up on Mount Sinai in this particular case here. And God told him to come up and he would proclaim his name. He would hide Moses in the cleft of the rock. He would come by and he would proclaim his name. That's interesting in itself because Moses asked the question uh, when he first is commissioned of God. He said, they will ask me, Mashimo, what is his name? He says, what do I tell them? And God says to Moses, tell them, Ihaye asha Ihaye, I am that I am, or I will be that which I am has sent thee to you, sent, them, sent you to them. But you know, they never asked Moses what his name was. But God knows they're going to. So in this case here, God is giving him, he's showing him, because we know by, uh, what is that? Is it Obadiah, I believe it is? Or no, Zephaniah, that God says to the people, wait ye upon me. 
for I am determined to rise up to the prey, just paraphrasing, and I will re re restore to the people a pure language where they can call upon the name of yod heh vav -Heh. That's God's divine name. People call it Yahweh. That's not correct. Well, see, God proclaims that name to Moses so he knows how to say it. And when Moses returns, the fulfillment of what he said to God, they will ask me what your name is, will be fulfilled. That prophecy will be fulfilled at the time of his second advent on earth. So God declares the name here. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, you know, the Lord, the Lord, God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. He's expressing God's divine name. Keeping mercy unto the thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, into the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let the Lord, I pray thee, go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Watch what God says to Moses. The Yomer, and he said, Behold, I make a covenant. Before all thy people, I will do wonders. Wonders, not marvels, wonders, incredible things as he did like he did with Moses when he went down to Egypt and he all the plagues that they brought on and, and the parting of the Red Sea. Now God is here. This is all past. And he says to him, you know, before all thy people, I will do marvels or, or wonders such as have not been wrought or done in this word here is actually done in all the earth. Something's about to happen greater. Nor in any nation and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. Now notice that right there. All, uh, and all the people among which you are shall see the work of the Lord. What people? Why didn't he say all the people of the children of Israel shall see it? We see clearly that the whole world sees in Revelation 11, they see these miracles because they even rejoice at their death. And so he says, all the people among which you are shall see the work of the Lord that I am about to do with thee, that it is tremendous. Now, in King James, it actually translates that word better. Let me pull that up for you. Genesis, or Exodus 34. And you guys, I'm sure, already have that, though, but... Verse 10. That last sentence, it says here, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. And and it says here, Ki hu asha ani ose imach. Ve'ra'ah, excuse me, here it is. Ve'ra'ah, there, there's the word. A terrible, uh, uh, yeah. when you say vara'a, it is, that's the word we use for evil. It is, it's a judgment that will come. What will God do with the two witnesses? It's beginning to look like me, the two witnesses, and, and that's why I read to you Revelation 11. We assume that the two witnesses are only for the sake of Israel, but it's beginning to appear it's not just for the sake of Israel. Because why? There was a mixed multitude that went out. And today the church is in bondage under a Pharaoh, a Pope of Rome, that does not know Yeshua. And he's setting taskmasters over you. And they've been perfecting all their miracles and stuff. Here recently they said the Pope, when he touched a vial of dry blood, it turned to regular blood again. He said it was the first of his miracles.
God sent Moses and Aaron to bring out the children of Israel that were in bondage. And not only the children of Israel came, but also there were Gentiles that came that believed. He sins again. And here's what's interesting. Moses, when it comes to the time when the death angel was going to strike, God commands him to take a lamb and have all the families to slay the lamb and put the blood over the door and over the lentils, the doorposts on the lentils. This shouldn't have been a strange thing for Israel. Abraham offered sacrifices to God. Isaac and Jacob offered sacrifices to God. But had Israel come to a place so long in Egypt, they had forgot how to offer a sacrifice before the Lord? Had they forgot how to apply the blood? Have we gotten so far from God that we don't know how to apply the blood of Christ anymore? There is a famine in the land. And it's a famine for hearing the word of God. When Yeshua makes the statement, and let me bring this for you as well. When Yeshua says in Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. If, if, if we were to say that, that what the churches have been doing, and, and I'm not against what, what the, you know, people have been winning souls to Christ, and I thank God for that. I'm not belittling that. But the problem is, is the gospel that Yeshua brought is not being preached to all the world because the gospel that the churches have brought have been, has been brought to all the world, and yet we're still here. There's no end. The gospel has not been brought to all the world. The two witnesses will bring the gospel of setting the captives free. And that's when the end will come, when their testimony goes forth, when they have preached the gospel to all the world in its purity, the way it should have been when Yeshua was here, the way Paul preached it, the way Jesus preached it. That's when the end will come. That's what will set you free. And what do they have to do? They have to come and have to withstand Pharaoh. Rome and Rome's army, but this time it's an army with nuclear weapons. It's an army that has got into the supernatural realms and can do something to another dimension. But God is much greater than all of that. God will bring down Rome and his empire. In fact, when they kill the two witnesses and they think that they have won the battle, then God will destroy Rome at that very hour. When what? When the whole world rejoices, the Bible says. He said, I shall bring all Edomia to nothing. And the one place that the whole world rejoices is at the death of the two witnesses. And God destroys Rome when they're killed. And then we find, and in, in, in remember also in Exodus 15, when Moses says, Asherah Adonai Ga'aga, oh, I will sing unto the Lord that he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. One horse, one rider. Moses was dealing with 600. Moses put the statement in the future. Even Rashi knew that. He said, Moses must be coming back. Sure he is. The Jews have always believed in the resurrection. You know what's interesting? It's not the only place. There's so many prophecies that God gave about Moses that have never been fulfilled. We see also in, in Revelation 15, they come out on the sea of glass mingled with fire. It's another exodus. And they sing the song of, 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 of Moses, the Bible says, and of the Lamb. You have a mixed multitude coming out through a red sea. This time that sea is red. Why? It is fire is a reddish color, an amber color. It's the judgments of God falling upon the earth. And God opens up that window to heaven and that mixed multitude comes out on there. And they're singing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. 
children of Israel. Just like Mary, when she picked up the tambourine and went down in the daughters of Israel, and they began to sing praises unto God. The Jews will know that the Messiah had come and that they missed him. And Moses and Elijah have preached this to them and they believed it, but they go out with what? A group that also knows that Yeshua is the Messiah. Could that be? I'm beginning to wonder if Revelation 15, maybe that is a rapture message. Maybe that is what that's a picture of. I can't say. I don't know. I remember Brother Gary said one time, he said his grandson, he said, uh, was jumping up. I think it was Brother Gary that told me this. He said his grandson was jumping up and down on the bed and said he didn't know much about the Lord. He's just a little bit. He fell about four years old. And he says to his mother, he says, as we go up, or excuse me, as the bombs come down, we will go up. That would be perfectly in line with their Revelation 15. It's interesting. History is about to repeat itself. God is going to send Moses and Elijah. They will bring judgments upon the earth. But I think that it will also help the true believers that love Yeshua already, not just the Jews. I think it's going to help a lot of people. I think it will clear up a lot of the doctrinal problems. Because why? So many of us, I'm, I'm there with you. I'm just your brother. I would love to know that really the deep truths of God, not some doctrinal denominational idea or the million different ministers on YouTube. I know I'm one of them. I don't say I have all the right answers. Wouldn't it be nice to know the way the gospel was preached when Yeshua was here? Wouldn't it be nice to see those sisters like Mary the sister of the woman at the well that ran in there and preached to all that city and won many souls to Christ? Wouldn't it be nice to see the gospel preached and it not have all the doctrinal opinions and you got to do this or you got to do that and if you don't believe this, we don't like you. And you know That's just like the way the devil is. The devil wants to put division among us. Somebody to hate something we said or something I said or something you said or something you believe in, you know, and... Don't do that. Hold Christ as the center of our heart. And let's always be willing from our heart that, you know, we can't say we know for sure everything just right. But there's coming a time when this evangelie, as Jesus said, when, when it was actually written in the Hebrew Matthew, he says, Matthew was quoting him, he says, when this evangelion, he used the Greek a transliteration of it there, has been preached into all the world, then the end will come. Gospel got perverted over the years. Not to say that we didn't win many souls to Christ. We have, and God is appreciative of that, but God also knows that Satan has tried to come in there and caused a lot of damage. And he has. Just like the women issue and stuff. So many women put back in bondage. When Christ came, it was a jubilee year. And I know that they're saying that this year is a jubilee year. And maybe it is. I don't know. I, I did a little math calculation from the time when Yeshua was here. And, um, and it may be this year, but I can say this much. Within a few years, uh, it will fulfill itself nonetheless from what I can see. But it's time that we get set free. And the only way it seems to me that we're going to really know that, I know Christ is the one that sets us free. It's through His blood. We need to apply His blood. We need to apply it on our lives and over our children, over our loved ones, and to believe. But I believe God is sending these two witnesses not just for the sake of Israel. I believe they're coming to break the hold that Rome has over the people. They will bring judgments upon Rome and the world. No military force will be able to stop them. Nothing will. God will make sure of that. If he has to hide them like he did Elisha, military couldn't see them nowhere. God can do that again. God knows how to do interdimensions as well. 
much better than Satan does. I trust this has been a blessing for you. I'm sorry that it's all broke up. I just don't know how to express it any clearer than I can. And I don't want people to misunderstand me and say, oh, Steve believes this or Steve don't believe that. Just take me from my heart what I'm trying to tell you. What, I, what I'm trying to get you to understand. Things may not always be the way we think they are. Anyway, God bless you. Shalom. Remember us uh, going back home. So just remember us. Keep us in your prayers. And, um, and we thank you for being a part of this ministry and supporting this ministry. Shalom.